Amen. So we are continuing in the book of Hebrews. This is, uh, you know, I always say, man, uh, this is, I think this is the third time I've preached on this same subject in Hebrews. <laughs> and I was like, how many times am I going to preach this? Well, every time it comes up in scripture, that's how I'm going to preach it. So, all right. So starting in verse four, it says, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then having fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the son of God to their own harm and holding them up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And here we go again. This is the third time in this Hebrew letter, okay, that the writer mentions apostasy. This is already the third time we're in chapter six. There's still more. This is the Greek word aphistemi, and it means a departing from God and an abandoning of what once believed and experienced in Christ. It involves a disowning of Christ, a departure from the body of Christ, and of the Christian faith. Okay? And scripture here in Hebrews issues real and urgent warnings about this grave possibility. And it's designed to both alert us of the deadly danger of apostasy and its consequences and to motivate us to persevere in faith and obedience. So why, were the, why was the, the writer of Hebrews here, why was he writing these things? So there's a few reasons. One of them was, is that they were scattered believers. Okay, they were scattered they were not gathering regularly, which is where we get our Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the gathering of the brethren, right? Because they were not gathering regularly. They were persecuted by a Roman government. They were persecuted by other Jewish people. And if we see from last week, they were not maturing in their faith. Sounds familiar. If only we could apply that sometime, somewhere in our Christian walk. One day... One day, save this for a later time. <laughs> so the divine purpose, though, of these warning passages is not to be weakened by the view that says the warnings are real, but the possibility of actual apostasy is not real. Okay? Right. And I'm gonna, I, I, I worked this. I've been praying about this for a couple months. Um, when I got saved... I was not taught uh, Calvinism or Arminianism. I didn't even know what that was probably till about 15 years ago. I was taught, read the Bible, do what it says. That's what I was taught. Read the Bible, do what it says. Read the Bible, do what it says. Read the Bible, do what it says. And so I'm coming from the view of, I like to read the Bible and do what it says. I like to study the Greek language. I like to know what things say. I've always been a student of the word of God. And so tonight is more of a teaching than a preaching. I'm going to do it like I do Bible study. If you listen to my Bible studies, I like to go through it slowly. I like to break it apart. I like to tell you what it says. We're in Psalms, so I like to tell you what it says in the Hebrew. So I like to tell you what it says in the Greek. I like to break it apart for you, okay? So the examination above is going to show that the, ref the writer is referring to sincere believers. Yeah. Okay. The phrase, it is impossible, denotes absolute impossibility. 
It has been contended by some that it denotes only great difficulty. But the meaning of the word impossible occurs only in the New Testament in the following places. In Matthew 19, 26, and in Mark 10, 27, with men, this is impossible, meaning that a man could not uh, save one who was rich, implying that that thing could not be done by human power. Okay? In Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God, referring to the same case. In Acts 14, 8, a man of, of Lystra, he was impotent in his feet. That is that he was wholly unable to walk. It was impossible for him to walk. That's where it's stated. In Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, what was absolutely um, impossible for the law to accomplish, which was to save people. Okay? Because we love those scriptures. It was impossible for the law to save people. We needed Christ. Okay? So this was impossible for the law to save people. We needed Christ. Hebrews 6, 18, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Right? We know it is impossible for God to lie. God doesn't choose to not lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Okay, Hebrews 10, 14, or 10 and 4, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sin. It is impossible that an animal's blood can fully take away sin. And Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So without faith, you cannot please God. It's wholly impossible. Okay. In all these instances, it denotes absolute impossibility. So these passages show that it's not merely a great difficulty to which the apostle refers, but that he means to say that it is wholly unfeasible. It cannot be done. Okay? And if this is the meaning, then it proves that if those referred to should fall away, they cannot be renewed. Their case is hopeless and they must, they must perish. That is to say, if a true Christian apostatizes or fall from grace, he cannot be renewed again. He cannot be saved. Paul did not teach that you could fall away and be renewed again as often as you pleased. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> For those who were once enlightened. The phrase to be enlightened is one that is often used in scriptures. It may be applied either to one whose understanding has been enlightened, right? To discern his duty, but is more commonly used as one who is converted, it does not of necessity refer to two Christians, though it more suggests the idea that the heart is truly changed, and so it is more commonly used in that sense. So some people will say, well, once enlightened isn't always necessarily about a true Christian. Okay, and in some cases that may be the case, but it's most commonly used that uh, for those who were once enlightened is used in the sense of one who has been truly converted, truly born again. But then we go on to say, and have tasted. We're reading this scripture. We're reading everything that he says here. So to taste of, thing, of something means to experience it or understand it. It is the, the expression is derived from the fact that the taste is one of the means by which we may um, ascertain, right, the nature or quality of an object. If, I've, if I uh, asked you if you've ever had um, a jalapeno, you would know whether or not you had tasted of a jalapeno. You'd certainly know it the next day. Yes. <laughs> but you would know without a doubt. You would say, you know, I'm not sure if I've had a jalapeno. I, I don't know. What's that taste like? If you've ever tasted anything hot, 
You know if you have tasted something hot. If you've ever tasted of anything sweet, you know that you have tasted something sweet because you, you've experienced it. You've tasted of it. You've experienced it. In Hebrews 2, 9, it says, but we see him who was, a little, uh, who was made a little lower than the angels, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He experienced death. He didn't, he didn't stick his tongue on it. I don't want any of that. No, he experienced it. So when, when the writer mentions here, he's tasted of the heavenly things. He's tasted. He's experienced those things. He's been intricately uh, in understandment of those things. The idea is that Jesus, as Jesus had experienced death, these here have experienced it and tasted the heavenly gift and learned of its nature. So they've tasted of the heavenly gift They've learned of its nature. As in 1 Peter 2, 3, if, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We have tasted of his goodness. We have tasted of his grace. We have tasted of his mercy. So he says, we've tasted of that heavenly gift. So this is the gift from heaven of that which pertains to heaven. Uh, the expression can mean a favor or gift which descends from heaven. It can be any benefits from God, which uh, he has conferred on man. It might include the plan of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, enlightening, renewing, sanctifying influences of the Holy Spirit, or any of the graces in which the Spirit imparts. But the use of the article, the, changes it. It's the heavenly gift. Have experienced the heavenly gift. So it's limited to something special, something different, something set apart, something that was directly from heaven, a special favor, which is conferred upon only the children of God. We know that the seal of the Holy Spirit then is only on the children of God. This is an expression which only may be applied to Christians. And these were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, partakers of the influences of the Holy Spirit. It is only in this sense that we can partake of the Holy Spirit. As in tasted, we partake of food when we share it with others. We partake of pleasure when we enjoy it with others. We partake of the spoils of war, right? We partake of the spoils of war when they are divided between us and others. We partake of those things. And so we partake of the influences of the Holy Spirit when we share influences conferred on the people of God. This is not language which can be applied to anyone but a true Christian. And though it is true that an unpardoned sinner may be enlightened and they may be awakened by the Spirit, but the language here is not employed to describe this kind of state. It is clearly expressive of those influences which renew and sanctify the soul. It's an elevated language that describes the joy of the Christian. And the understanding then, it is the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit in someone's life that has been born again. Okay, this is what we're talking about. That word gift is elsewhere used both for that of redemption generally, but most frequently for the gift of the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that, that uh, we are born again by the Spirit of God. And the Hebrew writer says, they have become partakers of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, not merely within the range of his influence, but actually share it and taste it. Have tasted of the powers 
In Hebrews 2, 4, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, okay, to the ones in which the gift of the Holy Ghost was manifested, which is the church, the people of God. So then this falling away after such enlightenment and such experience means total apostasy from the faith. This appears from the expression that follows and still more from those in the connected passage in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So such an utter apostasy was possible to these Hebrew believers. These were, these were scattered Hebrew believers that were oscillating between the church and the synagogue. For us, it might be the church and the world. And they might, were drawn at last into the atmosphere of the latter with the unbelieving Jews as to reject and to then re-crucify the son of God. The force of this word re-crucify to themselves is illustrated by Galatians 6, 14, where Paul says that he so glories in the cross of Christ that through Christ, the world is crucified to him and he to the world. That means right. All fellowship between Paul and the world was broken off. All fellowship between Paul and the world was completely broken off. I've been crucified to the world, the world to me. So here it implies that the breaking off of fellowship with what a man is said to crucify. They crucify again the son of God. Repeating what the Jewish fathers had done formerly when they gave him over to the death of the cross. But yet they're more culpable. Since after personal experience proving him to be the son of God, they not only make him as one dead to themselves, they expose him to the reproach and mockery of others. Again. So what is said of those who do this, that even unto repentance, it was impossible to renew them. Such a falling away after this experience precludes the possibility of repentance. On such persons, the power of grace has been exhausted. And there's a correlation between the state here described and the consequence of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in speaking of the unpardonable sin. In Matthew 12, 31, it says, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, he was saying that to the Pharisees that were attributing his works to Beelzebub, but Luke records him, he spoke it only to his disciples. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So he's saying to his disciples here, he says, when, when you have tasted of the goodness of the Spirit of God, and you've drank in everything that He's given you, and you've been renewed, and you've been made whole, and then you go back into your sin, or you go and, and uh, go back into the world and reject the Son of God, He's equating it to blasphemy. Of the Holy Spirit. In verses 7 8, it says, For the land which has drunk in often the coming rain and brings forth herbs, meat for them for whom it is tilled, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is rejected, and it is near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So now he's relating this to the land. He's relating receiving of the Holy Spirit to land which has received the rain. He says, so the the land that receives rain bring forth fruit. That's a normal product of the earth. 
A land that receives an abundance of rain will bring forth fruit. And so he's talking about there's an unproductive land along with the fruitful land that received the same rain as the fruitful rain. Not only did they received it, but they imbibed in that abundance of the supply of rain as the fruitful rain did. But he says it didn't produce anything. So its failure is its own fault. And it's regarded as responsible for and deserving of its final fate. And this illustrates the case of those who fall away after not receiving abundantly. After not only receiving that abundance and, and taking in so as to be filled with that gracious reign of the Holy Spirit. We see this in Isaiah 5, 4. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? So he's talking about, he, he's equating those then that have received the Holy Spirit to land, to two pieces of land that receive the same amount in abundance of rain. But one produced fruit and one was barren. And he said, the barren is its own fault. And it's observed that the land, though bearing thorns instead of fruit, is not yet spoken under the final curse, only near to it. So as to avoid even a remote suggestion that the Hebrew Christians had actually reached that hopeless state. They had not. But unless fruitfulness should ensue, they are warned of the inevitable end of the fate of those thorns and thistles, which is to be burned. Romans eleven twenty one and 22, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And you've, you've probably heard of Calvin's uh, predestination views. And, and really, it, it's done violence to the plain meaning of this passage. And he holds to the doctrine of indefectibility of grace, which, is, which states that um, one really regenerated cannot fall away, and that consequently one who has fallen away cannot have been really regenerated. But that is a very superficial and dogmatic prejudice against this set of scriptures here. Because we can't fail to see the whole accumulation of these verses and the intention of it expressing the very reverse of an apparent experience of saving grace. Because the depth of the experience is that the measure of grace that you received is the measure of the hopelessness of the fall. That's what he's trying to tell you here. The measure of grace that you have received, when you walk away from that, the measure of hopelessness of falling. And there are steps to falling away. We fail to take, God wor to take God's word seriously. We fail to take his truths, his exhortations, his warnings, his promises, his teachings with the utmost seriousness. Because God says what he means and he means what he says. There, there's no getting around that. And, and I realize that there's been a, so many preachers that have done damage to the word of God and the faith and have preached, you know, grace says you can live how you want and do what you want and you, 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 you'll be fine. And that's just not the truth. We have to take God at his word. And, and if there's warnings in scripture that there's no possibility of, why even put them there? 
That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you warn somebody of something that there's no possibility of? I just want to warn you that if you eat this snake, you're going to die. I hate snakes. I'm not going near it, let alone eating it. Why would you even warn me of that? We have to take God at his word. All of his word. You know, we can't be those people that just go and, you know what? This is my favorite. You know, we, we just, oh, what does God have to say to me today? And you just, you know, pop the Bible. And, oh, oh, I like that. <sighs> and, and you have to take everything in context. People take things out of context all the time. And they twist and manipulate scripture. And I'm like, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. That's not what it says. We have to take God at his word because we love the promises of scripture. And we love the, you know, we love the Jeremiah 29, 11s. And we love the, you know, Joshua, where you go, I'll go. And as as I was with Moses, I will be with you and I will not fail you. But read on. He says, if you continue in my word, read on. All of God's word. We fail when we do not gather with the brethren. Now he, and I've, and I've shared this with you before because Hebrews 10, 25 and 10, 26 are directly connected and, and people will read 10, 25 and then they go on and then 10, 26 is a new thing. And 1026 says, uh, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. It's directly connected to verse 25. Do not neglect to meet together as in the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I don't know about you guys, but the day is approaching. The day is approaching. And he says the habit of some, he said they've made it a habit of neglecting the gathering. And you can't read the word of God and say, well, my faith is personal. Because the word of God was written to a people. And all of, all of the exhortations, all the encouragement, it's for the people of God. It's for God's people. We're supposed to take care of God's people. When it says, when, when Jesus told his disciples He said, they will know you by your love, right? He said, by how you love one another. He was talking to his disciples, not everybody out there. He was talking to his disciples. He said, they will know the church by how the church loves each other and takes care of one another. That's how the world will know you're Christians, by how we stay connected. That's why some people call our church a cult. Because, because we, we love each other. We, we're connected to each other. We take care of one another. Do we take care of other people? Yeah. I, I'm not going to pass someone by that's dying on the side of the road. Are you kidding me? I, I'm not going to pass someone up that needs something or needs my help. Are you kidding me? But I'm so tired of American Christianity. It's godless. Individual Christianity is godless. Yeah, the, the communion that we take is not between just between you and God. It's between you and the body. That's why he says, if there's something against somebody else, you better go make it right. You're going to heap judgment on yourself. Why? Because, because this thing is real. And we make time for the things we love. We just do. We make time for the things we love. And in every one of our lives, people say, oh, I don't have time for that, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. You make time for the things you love and care about. Every single one of us, we all have the same 24 hours. And and we can look, and I can look at your checkbook, and I can tell you where you you spend your money on, what you care about, and where you spend your time. We make time for the things we love and we're supposed to love God's people. 
more than ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and I say, if you don't want to be in the house of God, why? Yeah. David said that that was the one thing I desired was to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Yeah. If you don't want to be here, why? Yeah. Well, I'm an introvert. Well, so am I. <laughs> That's not an excuse. Right. You know, and people use, well, I was hurt by my last church. Okay, get over it. Yeah. Forgive yeah. and move on. Yeah. You, 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 you don't even, you, you, if you don't love somebody that doesn't like you, you don't even know what true love is. Yeah. <sighs> get over yourself. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm not, I'm not getting anything from the body. Well, maybe someone's supposed to get something from you. Yeah. Why has it got to be all about you? Yeah. About to preach, man. <laughs> How do we fall away? We fail to take sin seriously. Yeah. You got to get radical with sin. Yeah. You got to get radical with those things. You know, and, and most of y'all know my, my testimony. I came out of drugs and alcohol and sex and rock and roll, you know, I mean, all that, all that sort of nonsense. And when I, when I, when I came to the Lord, I, I was like, I, I, I was not going back. Amen. And I didn't, I didn't go anywhere that had anything to do with drugs or alcohol. I didn't hang around with anybody that had to do with drugs or alcohol. I got rid of clothes. I got rid of music. I got rid of movies. I didn't watch TV. I spent three hours a day in prayer. That's not a joke. I memorized scripture all the time. I went to church, I went home, and I went to work and college. That was it. That was my life. Why? Because I, I needed the things of God. And I, was, I made a determination that I was not going to go back to what God brought me out of. Amen. You know, and, and for some reason, I understand people like, like if you struggle with something, don't go near it. If you struggle with pornography, get rid of your computer. Who cares? Amen. Don't go near it. Right. If you struggle with a certain kind of book, you don't read it. You don't have it in your house. Yeah. You, you, you know, you got to get radical with things. Because I'll tell you what, the enemy's never going to stop coming after you. We, we, we have to live in this flesh, but we don't have to walk in it. Yes. Yes. We, we fail to obey God. We disobey God. And this is a lot of what's going on right now, folks. And this is the spirit of lawlessness. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. The one who does the will of my Father. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? We did mighty works in your name. And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I preached on lawlessness a couple years ago. I know Jen and Casey, Jen was always like, that's lawlessness. <laughs> she was that whole time. <laughs> and, and lawlessness is doing things outside of God's law. It's doing things according to our own law. And because we have this lascivious grace message out there that I can live how I want and do what I want, I live according to my own laws. I govern myself. I do what I want to do. I'm not living according to God's law. I'm not living according to the things of God. And so he says, many will say to me, you know, I, Lord, I know you. Man, I was prophesying in your name. I was casting out demons. Man, I did all sorts of work in your name. Look at everything following me. And he's going to say, I don't know you. Because you didn't do my will. You didn't obey me. You operated in disobedience. How do we fall away? We fail to separate from the world. We vacillate between the world and the church. And through the deceitfulness of sin, we become increasingly tolerant of sin in our own lives. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today. So as long as every day is called today, which I think is every day that you live. <laughs> today. 
that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He says, encourage and warn each other daily. Every day, that means every day, as long as it's today, as long as you wake up. He said, encourage each other. Encourage and warn each other. Continue to run the race. Continue to do the things of God. Because what it is, it's the, heart, it's the deceitfulness of sin. Because listen, it, if you still have an, a, a desire to repent and convicted, the Holy Spirit's still working on you, okay? Yeah. That's why he said, even though I speak like this, yeah. even though I speak like this, I'm warning you, there's still hope. Yeah. It's through the deceitfulness of sin that our heart gets hardened. Yeah. So it's not just like we, 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 we fall into sin, a, you know, a couple times. We, we see that the prodigal, the father ret- received the prodigal back. Yeah. He fell into sin, right? So, but it's that continual sinning that leads to the hardening of the heart. Yeah. Because what happens is, right, is after the heart is hardened, we begin to more reject God's ways. We ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit. We put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. And this is that rejection of the Spirit of grace. He's called the Holy Ghost, not Casper the Friendly Ghost. That's a good one, right? I thought it was good. But he's holy. The Holy Ghost is holy. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. He is our guide through this life. But he's not Casper the friendly ghost. He's the Holy Ghost. He's holy. And so when we reject his ways, when we reject God's word, when we continually reject the things of God, we continually reject the voice of the spirit. We're rejecting the spirit. And it's through sin that our heart becomes hardened, which is why the Bible says, if you continue to sin willfully, it's not the place it, If you still, like I said, if you still have conviction and desire to repent, that's good. Conviction's a good thing. And the writer says, even though I speak this way, I'm persuaded of better things for you. Right? And the very state of mind of those who entertain such a fear is a sign that we are not of those who this text applies. If you read this and you're like, whew, it's not me. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) I've not fallen from grace. If you have grace to repent and long for pardon. And he goes on, he says, if we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He says, don't be, don't be sluggish. This is that same word used in 511 that uh, Pastor Jay read last week, where they were spiritually dull and did not want to listen. They were careless and negligent in their use of the precious grace of God. So he says, don't be sluggish. Listen to your teachers. Listen to those that are trying to help you. Listen to those that want what's best for you. Listen to those that have gone before you, that have walked out this walk. He says, be disciplined. Grow up and mature in the faith, right? Who was he talking to? Immature believers. He says, you need to grow up. Because as a toddler... You're going to fall away. You got to grow up. The church of Laodicea was apathetic and lukewarm. They were sluggish. And yet they were still secure in their own judgment. 
And, and, and folks, we, we, we are not those that, that have to walk around of, man, did I lose my salvation? Did I lose my salvation? Because we have an assurance of faith that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have an assurance of faith. As we are transforming more and more like him, we have an assurance of salvation. Not less and less like him. We have an assurance of salvation when we are obedient. So Lord, I, I have done everything you asked. Well done, good and faithful servant. We have an assurance when we are convicted of our laziness. So, oh Lord, forgive me, man. I've been lazy. We have, when we're convicted of our sin, when we're convicted of our disobedience, we have an assurance of salvation. It means the Holy Spirit's still working on me. He's still working on me. I'm still going. I may not be where I need to be, but praise God, I'm not where I was. And I'm going back, I'm going forwards and not backwards. Conviction is a good thing. And he ends by saying, be imitators of those who through faith and patience, and this word patience here means long suffering endurance. So look, look at those in the faith who have endured. Yeah. And we, you know, oftentimes we, we, we go to baby Christians and we're like, I'm going to follow you. Don't, uh. no. No. no, 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 someone that is endured intense persecution and affliction that is endured Long suffering, and they're still going. It's the reason I look to Pastor Ong, Pastor Connie. Man, they're still in the faith, (laughs) and they have endured. They have endured a lot, and they're still joyful. They still have hope, they still have love. It says, and imitate with diligence and long-suffering endurance the saints who have gone before us. It's an illustration of Abraham. And if you go read Hebrews 11, talking about prophets that never received the promises, imitate their faith. And we got the faith of Paul to look at. And Angie, Angie got me a, a book. You can come play, yeah. <laughs> Angie got me a book for my birthday about um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And if you and if y'all know know anything about him, you know he he stood up against the Nazis in uh, Germany, and he preached against them, and he was a spy, and you know, and he uh, was in uh, concentration camps, and got uh, sent to another concentration camp, and then he they they hung him. And I look at that, and I'm like, I want to endure like that. I want to endure like Paul. I want to endure like Elijah. I want to endure like Peter. You know, and Peter gives us hope. He denied Christ three times. But on that day of Pentecost, he was like, I ain't going back. I ain't going back to that scared person I was. I'm not going back to that. I'm moving forward. Be imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promise. Don't let anyone take your crown. Bow your heads. I, I, I always like to just give the Holy Spirit a minute. Apply the word to your life. There was something... God spoke to you tonight through this. Let that word apply. Let it do its job. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts away. It's so precise and so exact. Let it cut off that stuff it wants to cut off. And God is so gracious and he is so merciful. 
is that if we would just repent of our sins, that he would forgive us and cast them as far as the east is from the west. If you don't know the Lord, now's your opportunity. The only way to heaven is through the precious blood of Christ. Ask him to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and to translate him, translate you into his kingdom. If you've been far away and you're pricked in your spirit, don't let this moment pass you by. The Bible says Satan comes immediately, and as soon as we leave here, we forget what God was saying to you. And you go out, and then Satan steals that word that God is implanting in your heart. Let the word have its work right now. Let God have his way right now. Return to your senses. Repent of those things and run back towards the Father. And I want you to leave here tonight not afraid of losing your salvation, but an assurance that says, Lord, I am patiently enduring. God, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you lead me and you guide me in all my ways, Father. If if there's any rebellion in me, forgive me. If there's any disobedience in me, God, forgive me for that. We want to be obedient children. We want to persevere in the faith, God, and the assurance of hope, Father, that we forget those things which lie behind us and we press on towards the prize. thank you, God, for your word. I thank you that it's truth, even when we don't like it or want to hear it. God, I thank you that you spoon feed us our medicine when we need it, God. You share the sheep when we, when we need it. You take good care of us, God. You are a good, good father. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you so much for being online with us today. I want to remind you, if you're not a follower on Facebook, please like our page on YouTube. Please subscribe. Follow us on Twitter. Tell all your friends. Continue to watch online. We thank you for watching. We love you so much. Have a great day.